actually. He says, you should read this. It's a good book. So I did. And after reading it, um, I really felt convinced that it would be great for our city to bring Just back in and take a look at what we're doing and how we're doing it. So um, Mr. Clemente has been a key resource um, in making this happen. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and welcome everyone. Um, Rafael Clemente, I'm Executive Director of the Downtown Development Authority. Uh, we're really proud to have worked hand in hand with the city and the CRA on this. Uh, and I have to say I'm equally proud to see who's in the audience tonight. Uh, and I promise this wasn't a wedding gift for Jesse Daly. Uh, but we have business owners, we have residents, we have local decision makers, we have FDOT, county, city, staff people who are going to be key to implementing what we learn out of this. Uh, and I would say, and I, and I would, I would surmise that the city will echo this: is this is an opportunity for a big step forward for us. Um, there is a tremendous amount of private investment being made in our city right now. Huge, um, billions, more than more than a billion. Uh, and we have found ourselves in the past playing catch up with what the private sector's vision for our city has been. And now with this opportunity, working with Mr. Speck on learning how we can take that public realm and really make it function well for everyone. Uh, we're looking to position ourselves at least in step with, if not a step ahead of what's going on for our city. So without saying too much about what we're going to learn, I want to introduce um, Jeff Speck. If you haven't seen him. Okay, I'll before you get yep. into the introductions, I'm going to interrupt you. Please. Because I do see that we have our commission, Commissioner Verdick here in the audience. Thank you, Commissioner Verdick, for being here. Our cities and our communities around walking. 
Uh, and then I have another <coughs> talk that I gave most recently here that talks about what it takes to get people to walk. But, you know, if a vital place is full of pedestrians, which is what most people have come to believe these days, um, how do you get people to walk? And I don't have time today, because I have so many recommendations to confer, I, I don't have time today to go through that talk again. I do believe it was taped and it's available at the closed circuit here, is that right, Dr. Yes. Okay. And it's also now, as of yesterday, there's a short version of that that's a TED talk that's called The General Theory of Walkability. And the other one is just called The Walkable City. It's also a TED talk that I did. So if you're, if you're curious to learn more, um, you can access both of those talks. But today I'm really here to talk about West Palm Beach. So, um, beginning with this question, if a vital place is full of pedestrians, how do you get people to walk? Um, and in this country, and in most of the cities in this country, where, where driving is just so easy, and the car sits between you and everything, um, and you don't pay the full cost of driving, to get people to walk, you have to offer a walk that's better than a drive. Which means, that, and this is the structure that I presented to you last time, it means the walk has to simultaneously be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. For the purpose of this study and in describing West Palm Beach to you today, I reoriented it. First, I reorganized the first comfortable, interesting walk had been combined, and we're going to talk in this order today. The safe walk first, the comfortable and interesting walk second, and the useful walk third. So without further ado, let's get into what makes a walk safe and how that applies here. We're going to talk about having the right number of lanes, which means not too many. Uh, proper signals that invite pedestrians, lanes of the right width, one-way streets, not where you don't need them, protecting the curb, and welcoming bikes. The right number of lanes is a question, step back, obviously if you have more lanes than you have demand for lanes, then you have extra roadway that pedestrians have to cross that they shouldn't have to cross. You also have an encouragement in the wider roadway for drug for cars to go faster. And you know as a driver that you feel more comfortable going faster on a four-lane street than you on a two-lane street. So let's look first at Flagler. Flagler, and I'm, I'm jumping right into what I think is the first easiest win in this whole conversation. Flagler is a street that feels a lot like a highway that's separating you from one of your great downtown assets, which is your waterfront. And it, it is five lanes. It's four travel lanes plus a center turn lane. Um, and it is a barrier between you and the waterfront. So here's a diagram of what Flagler looks like now. And you see it's a five lane road. Now, here are the car counts. Here are the car counts we have for Flagler. They're all under, these are peak hour car counts, all under 1,000. We have one daily car count, which is 10,000 cars per day, which corresponds with the other numbers you see there. Now, if you're a planner, one of the first things you learn is that 10,000 cars per day is easily handled on a two-lane street. And in my work, I'm always looking for disconnects between the number of cars and the number of lanes. And this is a clear disconnect on Flagler, that in fact, if you change Flagler to a three-lane street, it would still be able to handle 2,000 cars per peak hour in all of these places where it's currently handling less than 1,000 cars at peak hour. So you actually have twice the capacity at three lanes on Flagler than you currently need. So you can grow a heck of a lot. By the way, vehicle miles traveled in this country, as you probably know, is falling. We're driving less than we did before. But in any case, with a three lane road, you have more capacity than you could ever need. So what I'm proposing for Flagler is simply a conversion of the outer lanes. In the case up against the edge of the city, uh, you can add parallel parking and a buffer in that outer lane. And then against the waterfront, where there are no interruptions, no roads crossing it for about a mile, right? You can have a continuous bike lane. So the bikes no longer have to battle the pedestrians, who you know are all wearing earplugs uh, on the pedestrian walk along the waterfront edge. Then there's another condition where it already has parallel parking. And there, just to use up that extra roadway, the parallel parking can be turned into angle parking. And I'm suggesting rear end just because rear end is safer, but angle parking then on the curb, you can see that on the left side of the street with the bike lanes. It's called a cycle track. It's two lanes of biking. It's a two, it's a two way bike path that's separated by a buffer on the flank of the road um, that has no curb cuts crossing it, except at the bridges. Now I noticed in looking at Google, 
I didn't witness it personally, but I noticed looking at Google that there's uh, a lot of cases where this street is actually closed for car rallies, for the boat show. Um, so we know that the city does not grind to a halt when Flagler is entirely offline. But what I'm suggesting is just that we, um, using just paint, and most of my suggestions today are just using paint, that we remake Flagler into a street that's still double the capacity it's currently handling, but is a top grade bike facility and provides the parking. If you're wondering why you can't get a restaurant east of the stash to succeed, one reason is because that edge feels like a highway and because the city is separated from its best natural feature by the highway. So that's Flagler. Interestingly, these are hard to see from where you're sitting, but if you, my study area essentially is from bridge to bridge downtown. But if you look further south, as I've done here, all the way to where Flagler basically begins, um, there are opportunities in every stretch to continue that bike facility and that parking facility. So what you see here is a five-lane section, a three-lane section, a two-lane section, different parts of Flagler heading south, and then here, different parts of Flagler heading north, four, four lane sections and a five lane section, where there's room in the roadway, both from extra lanes, but also from just lanes that are super wide and can be narrowed to the standard, and you'd have room for bikes and room for parking. So for me, that's an easy win, it's an inexpensive win, and I don't think people understand the full extent to which the separation from the intercoastals that Flagler provides is harming the vitality of your city. I think this is a very important change. South Dixie is a fun street to discuss. I know it's an F dot street, which means that it doesn't mean nothing's possible, it just means it's a longer process and a more political process. South Dixie is what we call a classic road diet. Now I'll explain what that means. This is the before picture, it happens to be now. Four lane road. The classic road diet, which, which these things are being built all over the country, is a four to three road diet. Where you take a four lane road, where you see it's a dangerous road because it's, the fast lane is also the turning lane, and one line of traffic stops for you and the other may not as you turn. And it converts it to a three lane road, which gives you extra room for other stuff. Um, this is not surprising, that when you convert a four laner to a three laner, the number of injuries drops precipitously. This is the surprise. This is a chart of 17 different road diets all four to three lane, all over North America, and you see that the number of cars being handled on the street does not drop. The average actually goes up very slightly. So the, the surprising lesson here is that the three lane street handles as many cars as a four lane street, because four lane streets are extremely inefficient. So my recommendation for South Dixie, which you know, beginning at Okeechobee, after the turn lane takes you into the campus area there, there's a long stretch there, it's probably several miles, uh, maybe a mile, where there's intermittent parking on the east edge, no parking on the west edge, and a lot of businesses that are struggling because they don't have the curb parking, and a lot of residents that are complaining that the people are parking in their streets when they're frequenting the businesses. So my suggestion is to begin the discussion with that thought about whether South Dixie can become a classic three-lane road bag. Proper signals. Tricky discussion. You have push buttons here in West Palm Beach. Um, you know, one of my jobs is to travel around and look at best practices in other cities and bring them here. Uh, this is an image that we planners have been using with some uh, pleasure for some time now. Um, the fact is that as you look around the country, the cities that are known for being walkable, the cities that have significant pedestrian uh, populations, don't have push buttons. You might have a push button at a major crossing of a state highway or some other place where there's an unusual condition. But the standard condition in Chicago or Boston or even New York City with you know, five lane avenues is not a push button. It's a simple concurrent signal. Additionally here, the push buttons are very frustrating. Most people don't realize that the push button doesn't, well, they realize it when they try it. The push button doesn't get you the signal. Right? What the push button gets you is a longer signal to make sure that you're able to cross the street. And that is still an issue in some places. But if you've had the experience that I've had of pushing these buttons and waiting, what seems what is, I've timed it sometimes two minutes or more to get the signal you jaywalk. And I have to say, I've crossed, I've crossed um, uh, quadrille maybe 40 times, and I've jaywalked every time. 
because you just don't want to wait and you take, you take your chances because uh, the signal is very frustrating. So what does it mean to have the sort of signals <coughs> that are both safer and invite pedestrian activity, rather than simply prioritizing the flow of what they call large squadrons of automobiles? The first is to only use push buttons where they're necessary and instead to have concurrent timing. That means when the cars get the green, you get the green. Second, where there's lots of pedestrians and the potential for a conflict between cars turning into intersections and pedestrians crossing, there's something called a lead pedestrian indicator that's now spreading around the country. And I recommend them at key places, like on, you know, for example, perhaps Dixie and um, um, Clematis, or better yet, Clematis and, and Okeechobee, sorry, Clematis and, and, and Quadrille, which it gives the, the pedestrian a three second lead. So the pedestrian is allowed to enter the crosswalk, claim the intersection before the cars enter. So I recommend those in certain key locations. Short cycles are really important because pedestrians hate to stand anywhere for more than 30 seconds or so. And again, the walkable cities, the San Francisco's, the Portland's, they rarely have a cycle longer, longer than 60 seconds for the whole cycle. Now the traffic engineers don't like this because yes, you can, you can move, I'm sorry, it's not squadrons, it's platoons. You can move more platoons of traffic. You can move more cars if the signals are longer. But if the objective is to move both cars and people, then a shorter cycle, a shorter cycle makes more sense. You do need buttons on your longer spans, but it's important to understand what that means. The typical person walks about four and a half feet per second. I walk six feet per second. This is three feet per second. Okay, it's not that fast. It's what we could call, you know, senior speed in the more challenged, you know, the people who are, the people who are out walking but aren't that comfortable walking and don't walk very fast. But three feet per second, per second means um, that you probably only need push buttons on Okeechobee, Quadril, and maybe Flagler. Because those are the only crossings that are that long. So I know you've got the buttons there, I know you've invested in them, uh, but the fact is that, that if you want to adopt the national best practices, you will convert them to simple concurrent signals without push buttons, except where you have these long spans. Next, lanes are the right width. This is probably the biggest and most important discussion we have to have today, is when you make your lanes the right width, all kinds of stuff becomes possible. Uh, Andres Galani likes to say the typical road to the typical subdivision in America has become so wide that you can see the curvature of the earth. And what's happened, of course, is that the standards have changed from, this is a subdivision in the 60s, and this is a subdivision in the 80s. And the standards have changed for all of our roads where we have this widening that's happened. So people go faster on wider streets. Why is that important? Well, if you are hit by a car going 35 miles an hour, you are 10 times as likely to die than if you're hit by a car going 25 miles an hour. So that cusp of around 30 miles an hour is super important. And the width of your streets and the width of your lanes are often what get people above or below that cusp. So, according to one study, increased lane widths are responsible for approximately 900 additional traffic fatalities per year. Citizens understand this, they demand narrower streets when they have a chance, and then the ITE acknowledges this, that's the Institute of Transportation Engineers, who wrote that this book, it's approved by the Federal Highway Administration, calling in downtown areas for 10-foot lanes, 11-foot lanes, um, versus 12-foot lanes. Most places I work, and here if I sound a little frustrated, is because I'm fighting this exact same battle in Montana, in New Mexico, and in a dozen other states, is the 12-foot standard which states and counties, every state I've worked in, every county I've worked, it's a standard they've imported from highway design and brought it into city design. And a lot of states and counties, and frankly cities, like cities in, in South Dakota, it's the standard, a 12-foot standard which we new urbanists believe is a much more dangerous thing. So this is, this is the two measures, which you'll find, we'll see in a minute, becomes super important, 12 feet versus 10 feet. It's what they say versus what we say. So what's the evidence? I'm going to talk to you about crash rates, crash severity, and traffic impacts. First of all, in terms of crash rates, I just showed you this. This was not done by a traffic engineer, so it doesn't count. 
You have to belong to the priesthood or you will not be listened to. So what does the priesthood say? Ashto, this is called the Green Book, it's the Bible of street design, the policy of geometric design of highways and streets. For rural and urban arterials, arterials are wide, busy streets. Lane widths may vary from 10 to 12 feet. Now bear in mind, most of your streets are not arterials. Right? The arterials are your streets that are handling a lot of traffic. Smaller streets with less traffic can be narrow, but 10 to 12 feet, so we're okay so far. 12-foot lanes should be used for practical and higher speed, free-flowing, principal arterials. However, under signalized conditions, operating at speeds below 45 miles an hour, narrower lane widths are normally quite adequate and have some advantages, so we're okay with Ashto. There's Okeechobee, see the 40 mile an hour speed limit, so it's below 45 miles an hour. Here's the Midwest Research Institute, another stodgy, old school traffic engineering organization. NC HRV Project 372, the relationship of lane width to safety. A safety evaluation of lane widths for arterial roadways. <coughs> Let me interrupt myself to say, I have to do this. Because if I don't do this, we're going to go away, I'm going to go away, and the DOT, or maybe not your DOT, but Someone's going to say, we can't do 10 feet because 12 feet is safe. And I'm trying to prove to you that it's not. A safety evaluation of lane widths for arterial roadway segments found no indication, except in limited cases, that the use of narrower lanes increases crash frequencies. The lane width effects in the analyses conducted were generally either not statistically significant or indicated that narrower lanes were associated with the lower rather than higher crash frequencies. Another study by traffic engineers and CHRP 330. All projects evaluated during the study that consisted of lane widths exclusively of 10 feet or more, in other words, we're looking from 10 to 12, resulted in accident rates that were either reduced or unchanged from 12 feet. Narrower lane widths less than 11 feet can be used effectively in urban arterial street improvement projects where the additional space can be used to relieve traffic congestion or address specific accident patterns. That's crash rates. Crash severity, we already talked about this. Clearly the faster you're going, the more people die. But I have to prove to you that wider lanes make people go faster, because even though you and I all know that, we need proof. And let me interrupt myself again to say that if I have another beef with traffic engineers, it's how few of these studies are done. It is really, really hard to, to find data. And the data I'm showing you today is all we've got. It's all that I can find. I work with a lot of engineers. This is all that we can find. Project summary report, design factors that affect speed on suburban arterials. Texas Transportation Institute is as conservative as they get. On suburban arterial straight sections away from traffic signals, higher speed should be expected <coughs> with greater lane widths. Okay, that's the only study, but that's what it says. Suburban arterial straight sections away from traffic signals, just like Okeechobee. I'm sorry, between, in other words, between the traffic signals and open children. Finally, traffic impacts. Oh, we're only concerned about safety, right? But traffic matters because, let's face it, if all we cared about was safety, then open children would be 20 miles an hour. But it's not 20 miles an hour because we care about volume. Well, the only study I could find was done by FDOT. And what FDOT's study said, so long as all other geometrical and signalization conditions remain constant, there is no measurable decrease in urban street capacity when through lane widths are narrowed from 12 feet to 10 feet. So there you have it, okay? Lane, lanes narrower than, 10, than 12 feet, down to 10 feet are not more dangerous. Wider lanes cause people to go faster, which we know results in higher death rates, and <coughs> it does not impact traffic to switch from 12 foot lanes to 10 foot lanes. Excuse me, John. Yes. Folks, we have lots of seats here. You want to come in and sit down, there's plenty of it. Seats in the front and on the side.